I wasn't planning on making this video, uh, but the issue just keeps coming up and I think it needs to be addressed. My last few videos have dealt with certain social problems and ideologies that have risen through the 20th century, specifically due to the introduction of new reproductive technologies like the pill. Time and time again, I see comments about how the artificial womb is going to eventually give men the same reproductive power that women have now. Um, the interest in this topic has no doubt been popularised by Barbarossa. Uh, being a transhumanist, he often takes us down some very deep rabbit holes of possibility. Uh, the ethics, the social change, and even lasting biological changes that future technologies could impart on our species. Now, I'm a transhumanist myself. I believe that whatever major changes are in store for you know, humanity in the future, it will come about through our natural reaction to new technological change rather than some concerted ideological or political effort. I mean, hell, smartphones have impacted our everyday lives far more than the economic policies of any political leader in the last few decades. I am a transhumanist. However, I am also a pragmatist. I'm just going to say this outright and get it over with. At this point, the artificial womb is straight up science fiction. Um, and I am extremely hesitant about any kind of investment in science fiction as a reasonable answer to the real world problems we are facing today. One of the few examples I could find of current applicable research towards an artificial womb actually comes from here in Australia. Apparently, due to the undeserved reputation as a man-eater, the grey nurse shark was hunted to near extinction. It's estimated that there are only a few hundred left in the east coast waters of Australia. These sharks, which birth live young, actually produce around 30 to 40 embryos at a time. However, they subsequently cannibalise each other in utero. So by the time the shark actually gives birth, there are only one or two baby sharks left. The hope of the researchers is that if they can raise these shark fetuses in isolated artificial wombs, they can bring all of the baby sharks to term and replenish the number of grey nurse sharks much faster than would be possible through natural methods. Now, the important thing to keep in mind here is that this so-called artificial uterus is really more akin to an incubator for preterm birth. Whilst the tank is filled with amniotic fluid to mimic the inside of the shark's uterus, the researchers actually perform a C-section on the shark and transfer already viable shark fetuses to the artificial uterine tanks. They're calling it an artificial uterus, and, you know, in some ways it is, but embryogenesis is beyond the scope of this particular technology. And that is really the crux of the problem. Pregnancy can be broadly divided into two processes, embryogenesis and fetal development. Um, given the subject matter, this may seem an incredibly crude analogy, but it's like the difference between cooking a complicated dinner from raw ingredients and simply reheating leftovers in the microwave. It's two incredibly different processes. Looking at this table hosted on Wikipedia, once you have a viable fetus, it's really just a matter of growth. Um, with current neonatal intensive care, even at three and a half months preterm, the baby still has a 50% chance of survival. That's even before the end of the second trimester. Embryonic development is very different. You're effectively building an entire person from a single cell, and the environment this happens in is integral. Hormone levels are incredibly important. They turn certain genes on and off through certain stages of development. Barely noticeable imbalances caused by things like the mother's overall stress levels can result in epigenetic malfunctions. Even morning sickness plays its part. Morning sickness is very common amongst pregnant women, which argues in favour of it being a functional adaptation and against the idea that it is pathology. Fetal vulnerability to toxins peaks around three months, which is also the time of peak susceptibility to morning sickness. There is a good correlation between toxin concentrations in food and tastes and odours that cause revulsion. Women who have no morning sickness are more likely to miscarry 
This may be because such women are more likely to ingest substances that are harmful to the fetus. Basically, the mother's body is regulating the nutrients, hormones, and even filtering out toxins at a biochemical level. The act of reproduction is such a biologically holistic process that creating a viable artificial womb for ectogenesis rather than just fetal development could basically mean creating an entire artificial human body first. It's just not feasible. And beyond this, even if it were feasible, technical development isn't the only hurdle. Consider that IVF today is about $10,000 a pop, and that basically amounts to a turkey baster and a few follow-up appointments with the doctor. I'm being facetious, of course, but you get my point. IVF is a $10,000 procedure to implant a fertilised egg in someone who already owns the requisite reproductive hardware. In comparison, imagine the cost of highly complex precision equipment that is rented out for nine months at a time and needs to be under the constant surveillance of highly skilled technicians. And I know the stock argument that technology decreases in cost over time, but it just doesn't actually work that way. If you don't believe me, talk to any car enthusiast and they will gladly tell you about what a fucking pain in the ass it is to work on modern cars. It's absolutely true that fancy new technology always starts off in you know, expensive high-end cars like Range Rovers and the C-Series Mercedes, and then eventually over the course of a decade or so, that technology trickles down to more affordable Japanese hatchbacks. However, Rather than the technology getting cheaper, what it's actually meant is that basic servicing on your Honda Civic has now become almost as expensive as servicing a Range Rover. 30 years ago, if you were having problems with your carburetors, you could just yank them out and leave them in throttle body cleaner overnight. Nowadays, an injector problem means having to take your car back to the dealership where they attach the car's onboard computer to incredibly expensive and proprietary diagnostic equipment. Yes, the technology has become cheaper, but you're also now reliant on technology so sufficiently advanced that even a mechanically-minded car enthusiast can no longer fix basic problems on his own. Upfront technology costs have decreased, but ongoing servicing costs have actually increased. This is a problem. No matter which way you slice it, the artificial womb will never be a technology simple enough that average Joe can operate it by himself in his basement. You would need five different PhDs all rolled into one just to fix minor problems that occur. And that rather conveniently segues into the regulatory issues. Does the government really want some guy with the ability to play out his boys from Brazil fantasy in the privacy of his own basement? I mean, here within the online MGTOW community, we can comfortably explore the ethical question of, you know, reproductively irresponsible women effectively having that exact same power now. But you know, like, you just know that medical ethics boards and governments, and in particular female lobby groups, both feminist and traditionalist, are not going to see it as the same thing. Not now, not ever. Regardless of what women can and do now, no government is ever going to say, here you go and just hand artificial reproductive technology to some fucking guy on the street. I mean, just look at the current ethical consensus on cloning even single stem cells. Hell, look at how surrogacy is viewed. The general public don't want couples, much less single men, to have the ability to buy babies. If the technology is ever actually developed, it is going to be incredibly tightly regulated. What that ultimately means is it's never going to be for the express benefit of men. At best, it will be for barren women who want to have children but can't. Basically, even if this technology is feasible, the artificial womb is never, and I mean never, ever, going to be for men what IVF is for women today. It just isn't. And you know, the purpose of this video is not to bash on Barbarossa at all. Some of my favourite topics by him are his forays into transhumanist possibilities. Um, speculating on what new technology could mean to our species is interesting, 
and it's informative and it's fun, even in a purely hypothetical science fiction scenario. I just want to be mindful about investing any kind of real energy promoting a solution that is likely to remain a science fiction thought experiment for at least the duration of our lifetimes. Frankly, there are far more immediate technologies on the horizon, like vassal gel and the male pill, which are currently both undergoing medical trials in India and Indonesia and could be available on the open market as early as 2018. Now, these technologies aren't going to impart men with the same reproductive enfranchisement that women inherently possess by virtue of their biology, but it will balance out some of the power. More than 50% of pregnancies are unintended. Unintended is in scare quotes because they're really only unintended for men. A woman is now in complete control of her reproduction throughout every step of the process. The pill, IUDs, RU486, surgical abortion. If she decides to carry the baby to term, then there is nothing unintended about it. She has made a conscious choice a choice that men do not equally possess. In light of something like vassal gel, however, her ability to have an oops pregnancy goes out the window. If she wants a baby, she basically has two options. She either has to get the expressed consent of the potential father, you know, an amazing concept I know, or she has to do it on her own through a sperm bank, which comes with an incredibly expensive upfront cost and zero child support extractable from a hapless, non-consenting father. It's not the holy grail of reproductive enfranchisement, but I do think that male contraceptives of this calibre will be a game changer. And perhaps even more so than we think. You know, the issue of reproduction comes up a lot, specifically men's ability to have children on their own in a way that women nominally can now. If we're being honest, though, sex is the proximate cause, reproduction is the distal cause. Um, further to that, I'd actually argue that reproduction rather than just sex is m probably more proximate to women than it is men. You know, the evolutionary roles of men and women in reproduction are quite different. Uh, as a result, men are primarily interested in the act of sex. Women are primarily interested in the biological fallout from sex. When the vast majority of guys are getting lucky with some random from the club, they generally aren't thinking, okay, time to make a baby now. Likewise, next time you're at a family barbecue or whatever, pay attention to how clucky the women get around their friends' babies compared to their boyfriends or husbands. To the extent that guys do eventually want to leave a genetic legacy, they are still usually more immediately concerned with getting laid at any given time. This being the case, I think for men and more broadly male sovereignty, the issue of sexual enfranchisement is potentially just as important as reproductive enfranchisement, which is why I want to finish this off by discussing a few other technologies, primarily sex bots. Yeah, they're always brought up, usually in the same conversations with the artificial womb, and frankly, I see this technology suffering from the exact same problems. The technology is potentially decades off, maybe more in the case of hyper-real synthetic humanoids like Caprica 6 and Cameron. As with the artificial womb, the cost would be outside the ability of most men to afford and maintain. Even with simple consumer robotics now, like 3D printers, you basically have to be an engineer yourself to fix all the minor problems that come up, like stepper motor alignment and jams in the hot extruder. There is lots of moving parts and lots of things that can go wrong with a fully mobile humanoid robot. Again, there are better, more immediate technologies available now. I think it will be a very long time before we see rubber-clad robots with you know, single hinged jaw pieces climb their way out of the uncanny valley. Video games, on the other hand, are already on the cusp of hyper-real human characters, fully articulated, even featuring realistic animated facial expressions, motion captured from real life people. And beyond that, given the mass consumption of highly stylized Japanese anime and hentai porn, it's possible that sexual titillation doesn't require hyperrealism at all. In fact, 
Hyperrealism is possibly more of a turn-off as it slips further and further into the uncanny valley the way many modern physical sex dolls do today. I think a simple, stylized yet highly animated virtual anime character will be far more effective than a you know, $7,000 Abyss Creations real doll. The fact is that while some people are biding their time waiting for Ava from Ex Machina to arrive, there are already consumer-grade virtual reality headsets available today. These technologies could easily be combined with already existing off-the-shelf toys like the Fleshlight. I mean, honestly, something like this Japanese virtual reality sex simulator could be built by a couple of savvy guys over a weekend. Hell, I've been to hackathons and seen far more complicated projects developed and built in that time frame. And with the ability to freely share open source code and 3D printable schematics online, such technology would be almost impossible to regulate. None of the technological, financial or regulatory limitations of realistic humanoid robots apply to virtual reality simulators, and the technology is only going to improve. I suspect we will end up with a cheap, solid-state method for neural stimulation that could be combined with other virtual reality technologies to realistically simulate touch long before we ever develop reasonable robot-human facsimiles for our sexual consumption. You know, I'm not trying to be a downer here. I'm just saying that I think a lot of people in this community are waiting for some fanciful science fiction solution when there are far more immediate technologies waiting at our doorstep. 